With the official reveals of the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X, a powerful divide has once again been stirred up amongst the gaming community. That's right, the console wars are back. Now, in a year like 2020, where so many things have gone so horribly wrong, this cycle's iteration of the console wars hasn't really been quite as pronounced, but you can still find Xbox supporters and PlayStation fanboys duking it out in various pockets of the internet. But why do we do this? Why do we lambast each other over pieces of technological hardware and cling so desperately to the notions that not only one of them is superior in every way to the other, but also that liking the quote-unquote inferior one makes you lesser? It essentially boils down to two groups fighting over something that is meaningless at the end of the day and in the grand scheme of things. Yet, we continue to argue every single time a new generation of consoles emerges. The field of psychology offers up an explanation for why we as humans tend to engage with opposing groups in this manner, and today, we'll be taking a look at that reasoning. So, welcome to Psychology of Gaming, the series where we look at how psychological principles are worked into games, and how games can affect us psychologically. In today's lesson, we examine the psychological motivators responsible for the console wars by furthering our understanding of in-groups and out-groups. So in order to understand this video, it's first important that we establish how psychologists define in-groups and out-groups, and what motivates the rivalry amongst them. Social psychology is one branch of study that focuses on how individuals think and behave when put into social situations. Therefore, in-groups and out-groups both contain a multitude of people within them, but ultimately, the perception of these groups relies on the individual in question. The individual's mindset on the subject in question is what defines both their in-group and their out-group. An in-group, then, is a collection of people that the individual identifies with usually over a shared bond or connection. Some examples of in-groups that you may be involved in include your circle of friends, your teammates, your co-workers, your political party, your fellow church members, or your classmates. It's important to note, though, that these are the most basic of in-groups. An in-group can even be something as small as the people you get paired up with a group project in school, or the people sharing a subway train cart in New York City, or even a group of football fans attending a game. The commonality that binds people into an in-group doesn't have to be some extravagant or ever-present factor. It can be just about anything that links people together for any length of time. An out-group, then, is a collection of people who oppose the thoughts, the opinions, the beliefs, or the behaviors of the individual's perceived in-group. Just as the name insinuates, members of the out-group are outsiders, people who are not linked together by the common trait. So, looking back at the examples I listed just a moment ago, if your in-group is your co-workers, Rude customers could be called the out-group. If your in-group is a bunch of Eagles fans attending a game, a collection of Cowboy fans may be the out-group. And if there's some knuckleheads acting up on the subway train you're in, they'd be the out-group opposing the calm passengers making up your in-group. And given it's an election year here in the United States, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out Republicans and Democrats as in-groups and out-groups. Whichever side you agree with is your in-group, while the other is the out-group. The point is, whatever links the in-group together is different and opposed by the out-group. 
One of the most fascinating psychological studies regarding in-groups and out-groups wasn't even solely focused on researching these groupings, and it wasn't even conducted by psychologists. Meet Jane Elliott, an educator who, unknowingly at the time, conducted one of the most insightful experiments in the history of social psychology as she attempted to display the reality of racism for her class of young children. In 1968, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and his death sent a shock throughout the nation. Elliot was appalled by King's death and knew that her young students would certainly ask about his assassination at school the next day. She decided that the most impactful way for people to begin to understand the crippling effects of racism was to experience it themselves in some capacity. The next day came and the children asked about King's death and Elliot spoke about the ill nature of racism and asked her students if they wanted to know what it felt like. The children agreed and the experiment began. Elliot told her class that children with brown eyes were superior to the children with blue eyes. Brown eyed children were given extra privileges and encouraged to demean the other children with blue eyes. The brown-eyed children quickly formed their own in-group and acted relentlessly towards the out-group, that being the blue-eyed children, as the day went on. It took a little bit of nudging, but once Elliot introduced the notion that the brown-eyed kids were smarter, the children became vicious towards their quote-unquote inferior classmates. Elliot was stunned to see not only how the children became so arrogant so quickly, but also how it impacted their abilities in simple tests. The brown-eyed children performed remarkably better on tests that day, while the blue-eyed children performed lesser than they had before. The next school day, Elliot reversed the roles, making blue-eyed children superior to brown-eyed. She was surprised to see that the blue-eyed kids, while still a little mean, were not nearly as severe with their words and actions towards brown-eyed children. Their experience the previous day allowed them to better understand how adversely it could affect their well-being. It's a fascinating study, and if you want more information, check out the link in the description below. For the purpose of this video, we can easily identify the brown-eyed children as being the in-group for themselves that were opposed by the out-group made up of the blue-eyed children. If you were a brown-eyed kid, the other brown-eyed kids made up your in-group and were opposed by the out-group of the blue-eyed children. But if you were a blue-eyed kid, those fellow classmates that had blue eyes, they were your in-group and the brown-eyed children were the out-group. Again, remember it's important to note that in-groups and out-groups can be decided on an individual level. Whoever the individual kid is, whatever characteristic they had, the brown eyes or the blue eyes, that's what determined their in-group and their out-group. With those examples, you should now have a pretty solid idea of what makes up an in-group and an out-group, so let's shift our focus back to video games. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this by now. With the imminent release of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, the so-called console wars have once again begun as fans of Sony and Microsoft buttheads determined to prove the validity of their console over the other. We argue about the internal makeup of the hardware and pick apart its specs to see which console will run games smoother and prettier. I mean, who could forget when Microsoft announced that the Xbox Series X would have 12 teraflops of processing power. Okay, maybe that one did come off as a little funny to the everyday gamer, but for diehard fans, it was a point of emphasis that the Xbox had over PlayStation. In fact, Xbox has had the most powerful console in the last few generations, but when it comes to exclusive software, PlayStation has reigned supreme. Console exclusives have been the bullet most often fired by members of PlayStation's in-group against the out-group of Microsoft. What good is a powerful console if it doesn't have any exclusive games to draw you in? These points of contention 
graphics, and games have dominated the console wars throughout history and has provided many folks with ammunition to use against their competitors. Here in 2020, with the release of the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 right around the horizon, two groups of people have formed. Those in support of the PlayStation over the Xbox, and those who support Xbox over PlayStation. Regardless of which one you support, the people that agree with you make up your in-group. You immediately have something to connect with them over, even if you don't know anything else about them. And we typically tend to trust people within our in-groups even if we just met them because of the commonality that we share. In-groups provide us with a sense of belonging, which is one thing that every human craves. And on top of that, in-groups also prove to be a heavy source of confirmation bias. If we believe that Xbox is better than PlayStation, and we can find a whole bunch of people who agree with us, then it helps us solidify that notion in our head that the console we support is objectively better than the other. In-groups also provide a sense of strength in numbers. We feel safer when we are part of them. However, that's not really a factor that applies in console wars. No one's life is really in danger here. Uh, I'd hope so anyway. The opposing console supporters make up the outgroup in this case, and these two sets of people are destined to clash. It's important to note that in-groups are not objectively right, while outgroups are objectively wrong. Obviously, depending on which console you support, your label of in-group and out-group is going to change. If you support PlayStation 5, that grouping of people becomes your in-group, while Xbox Series X supporters would be your out-group. But, those labels would switch if your taste in consoles changes. Remember, being in an in-group at one particular moment doesn't lock you into that side of the debate for the rest of your life. These are ultra-fluid categorizations we're talking about here. For example, say you're a pedestrian waiting to cross the road, but no cars seem to stop for you. Your in-group in that moment is pedestrians, and you feel pissed off that none of the drivers will take a minute to let you pass. However, if the roles change and you're the one in the car driving, it feels like the pedestrian is a nuisance and they can wait a few extra seconds while you cruise by. Your perception in any given moment determines your in-group and out-group for that particular moment, but it can change in a heartbeat. The same is true for Xbox fans contemplating a PlayStation 5 purchase and vice versa. At the end of the day, the critical point to understand about in-groups and out-groups is that they are arbitrary in nature and usually divide people unnecessarily. Sticking with the main example of this video, sure, it's all in good fun to support PlayStation over Xbox or vice versa, but getting enraged at other people over the internet over a piece of hardware isn't a good look. And within these two groups, the fact remains that we are all passionate about video games and enjoy experiencing them, and that's what's most important. It's healthy for us to recognize our own biases and assess things from multiple perspectives. I'd encourage people to attempt to better understand the outgroups that oppose their viewpoints as it makes us all more well-rounded people. Don't bring unneeded stress into your life by worrying about which $500 console people are more likely to buy, regardless of which one you believe to be superior. The console wars separate us into these in-groups and out-groups, and it's fine as long as it's all in good fun. But it's imperative for us to remember that we all love video games, and to allow that fact to connect us instead of dividing us. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode of the Psychology of Gaming series, consider checking out some others on the channel. And yes, I must admit, I did use only PlayStation exclusive footage for this video. It's just my little way of poking some fun at the subject matter, and I hope you enjoyed that touch. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing for more. Follow me over on Twitter at NopeNapNarp, and as always... Have a nice day, and take care.